Um, okay, so today's lecture is going to be uh, about database storage part one. This is the first of a uh, two-part lecture. Um, just before we get going, uh, a few housekeeping things. Um, so homework one is going to be due on Sunday, September 12th at 11.59 p.m. Project number zero is also due Sunday, September 12th at 11.59 p.m. Uh, and project number one will be released uh, the following day, Monday, September 13th. Um, a few other things, unfortunately, uh, uh, you may have noticed DJ Mushu couldn't be here with us today. Um, he's actually out on the West Coast uh, in LA. I don't, I don't wanna get too much into details about it. Um, he has this like long-standing beef with a, a crew out there, so he's trying to get that wrapped up and uh, he should be back in class on Monday. Um, the, the other thing, uh, the office hours should be finalized uh, now on the website. Um, a few of them have switched to, to Zoom only, so you have uh, a more uh, remote only options if, if uh, you'd prefer. Um, and we also created a Google Calendar, uh, which is now posted on Piazza, um, that shows uh, office hours, deadlines, those sorts of things. Okay, so that's, that's all the uh, housekeeping stuff. Are there any questions about anything related to that before we get started with the material? Great. Okay, so just kind of a, a high-level recap, uh, an overview of what we've talked about so far. Um, mostly we've been focused on the high-level or application-level side of things. Um, topics like the relational model, SQL query languages, how um, the, an application or an end user would interact with the DBMS. Uh, so kind of now our focus is going to shift for uh, the rest of the, the semester about how to build the software that actually manages the database, so how to build a database management system and kind of go through all the different uh, layers of that. So uh, I showed a slide that was similar to this uh, in the very first lecture, um, and kind of it, it breaks down the different high-level pieces that we're going to cover in the course. So we've already kind of talked about the, the high-level idea of relational databases uh, and query languages, and now we're going to, to dive down into each, each layer of the, the system. So starting with storage, um, working up to query execution, Concurrency control, so if you have concurrent um, transactions or queries that are executing, how do you, how do you manage that? Recovery, uh, if your system crashes, how do you, how do you recover from a failure? Uh, and then some more advanced topics at the end. But, so, th so that's kind of the high level outline. The other way that you can think about it uh, is sort of this um, uh, software stack diagram that's, that's shown on the other side of the slide where uh, kind of the, the base layer is uh, the disk manager and we build uh, additional layers on top of it. So each one of these um, uh, blue boxes corresponds roughly to a self-contained part of the system. So each one of these um, uh, boxes represents kind of a, an abstraction that each uh, upper level in the stack can kind of call on and interact with doesn't need to worry about the implementation, implementation details of the layers below it, but it can still have some kind of uh, API where it, it gets what it needs from those layers. So uh, not everything is you know, perfectly clean cut. They're not all, sometimes certain layers will need to um, interact with each other or know what's going on at a finer grain level, but uh, in general, the, the system is designed to be modular such that you can build these layers one on top of the other and you don't have to know necessarily low-level details um, of the underlying layers. So the, the uh, topic of, of this lecture and the, the next lecture um, is going to be specifically the disk manager component that manages uh, how the system is going to interact with the underlying uh, file system. So kind of the, the, the uh, whole premise of this course is going to focus on uh, what we refer to as a disk-based DBMS architecture. And what that means is that the, the DBMS is going to assume that the uh, primary storage location for all of the data in the database 
uh, is on some non-volatile secondary storage. So you have some persistent storage medium like uh, disk or SSD or, or something like that. And uh, the DBMS assumes that all of your data lives um, uh, on that storage medium. Uh, so the, the, the components are going to uh, manage specifically the movement of the data, the database files, to and from whatever your secondary persistent storage is. So the DBMS is going to handle reading from and writing to uh, the underlying disk. So it's, it's helpful to think about kind of the, uh, at a high level, how the storage hierarchy in, in a system works. So kind of starting at the top, you can get all the way up to like the CPU and at the very bottom is the uh, kind of lowest form of uh, storage. And it's, it's helpful to think about kind of the trade-offs that you get with each, each one of these layers in the hierarchy. So at the top, again on the CPU side, um, it's much faster to access data uh, if it's in CPU registers or CPU caches, but uh, the available space that you have to store data is a lot smaller and it's, it's much more expensive per you know, byte of, of data that you store. And as you go all the way down to the lowest layers, uh, it becomes much slower to access data, uh, but you have a lot more space and it's, it's cheaper per byte. So the, the important distinction that, that we're going to make um, in the course is between volatile and non-volatile storage. So uh, volatile storage, um, you typically can access data uh, uh, randomly and it's byte addressable, but the problem is that uh, if if the, you remove the power source, so if you uh, trip on the plug and it gets unplugged, or you know the, the power goes out, or uh, for, for whatever reason um, the, the system crashes, you're going to lose all of the data that you have sitting in, in your volatile storage. On the other side of the line is uh, non-volatile storage, um, which is typically block addressable, so you can't uh, necessarily access an individual uh, byte. You can get a, a rather a block of data, a block of, of um, a, a range of bytes. Um, but the, the, the benefit is that uh, if the power goes out, all your data is safe. So power can go away fully, plug it back in, and um, all, all the data is there. So um, kind of this, this uh, split here is, is the important part um, we're going to care about for for uh, correctness guarantees in our system. So anytime that we talk about uh, DRAM, uh, we're just going to refer to it as memory in the course, and anytime we talk about any kind of disk or persistent storage, it's anything that's uh, non-volatile. So it could be SSD, it could be a traditional hard disk, uh, it could be some kind of network storage, uh, whether that's like a distributed file system like HDFS or, um, if you're on the cloud, maybe like Amazon S3, just something um, where you have network accessible storage. So kind of just memory is volatile and disk is uh, a non-volatile storage. And then there's also um, some, as I mentioned, higher level CPU storage, um, but for the purposes of this course, uh, we're not really gonna be concerned with that. So this is kind of the, the traditional hierarchy. Um, there are other uh, uh, storage modalities. So, for example, if you have fast network storage, um, we're not really gonna be too concerned with that. Uh, there's this other layer um, that kind of sits in between uh, uh, DRAM and what, what uh, you would consider persistent storage, it's called non-volatile memory. Um, the, the marketing people decided it would be better to be called uh, persistent memory, so you might see that now. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting because it, it gives you a lot of the same properties as uh, traditional DRAM, but if you uh, remove the power, it retains uh, the data. So there are some trade-offs. Uh, it's more, more uh, expensive than some other forms of um, persistent storage. Um, and it's, it's slower than just a regular DRAM, but it gives you the byte uh, accessibility and also you don't have to worry about losing your um, uh, data. So 
Uh, Andy actually, uh, in, in his uh, first PhD student, Joy actually wrote a book um, about non-volatile memory database management systems, kind of uh, how to redesign the stack um, to, to uh, benefit or best leverage from uh, non-volatile memory. Um, and there are in increasing numbers of products being released. Um, this, this one's from Intel. Uh, for a long time, uh, there was this sort of uh, uh, constant promise of um, non-volatile memory out there. Uh, it, 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 the the, the uh, marketing people always said it was coming soon, um, but uh, soon never really came. So it's kind of been in this perpetual limbo, but uh, more and more products are starting to come out. And maybe, I don't know, within the next 10 years or something, it, it might become more commonplace. But um, for now, we're not going to worry about it because um, you know, it's, it's not um, common in, in typical uh, deployments. So another way to think about kind of the storage hierarchy is to consider the access times for each uh, layer in the stack. So at the top, uh, you have the, the CPU caches, and those take like I, on the order of nanoseconds. Um, and on the very, very bottom uh, is, is tape archives, which is like a, that's a billion nanoseconds. So uh, these numbers are, are kind of uh, difficult for uh, you know, humans to wrap their heads around. So if we convert it to a, a little bit easier time scale, um, if you think about it, normalize it to like seconds, uh, on the top reading from the CPU cache is like half a second. Um, and on the very bottom, if you want to read from tape, that's going to take you like 31, 32 years. So um, this kind of storage hierarchy is going to be important because as designers of the DBMS, uh, it's important for us to consider the access latencies to uh, the, the, the different levels uh, of the storage hierarchy where data can live in the system. So maybe another, another uh, helpful way to think about it um, from a, a famous database researcher, Jim Gray, um, his, his analogy was uh, in terms of like, if you want to read a page from a book right in front of you, that's like uh, accessing at the, the highest uh, layers in the, the hierarchy. Um, going to disk is equivalent um, to going to like Pluto. And then if you want to read from tape, that's like going to, you know, a, a different galaxy altogether. Um, so again, this is going to be really important uh, just to keep in the back of your mind um, when thinking about the, the uh, design decisions in the system. So uh, I also mentioned that um, there's this distinct distinction between sequential versus random access. So um, typically uh, in, in memory, random access is okay. You can you know, access a random um, offset in an array and it's not uh, too bad, sequential access might be a little more performant, but um, th there's virtually no difference between them. Whereas uh, if, you're, if you're accessing data stored on a, a traditional um, hard disk, uh, because of the way the uh, um, uh, disk, disk read head has to move to, to access data on different platters, um, it's, it's more beneficial to do sequential access. So the, the DBMS, kind of design we'll be focusing on um, is really going to need to consider these access patterns sequential um, versus uh, random. So the, the, the algorithms, a lot of the algorithms we'll look at um, are going to try and, and maximize uh, sequential data access for contiguous um, uh, data blocks at, at all costs. Uh, and kind of the, the allocating multiple pages um, at the same time in, in like a contiguous range um, is referred to as an extent. So kind of the, the design goal um, that, that we're looking at here is to allow uh, the DBMS to manage a database that exceeds the amount of memory available. So this was especially important uh, a long time ago when, when memory was scarcer than it is now. Um, but uh, you know, if you have a really large database, you're still running.
Cool, okay, let's get started. Uh, so today's class is uh, about database storage part two. So it's a continuation from uh, last week's lecture where we talked about kind of the low level um, implementation details of uh, storing data in um, the database management system. Uh, before we get started, just a couple um, administrative things to check off. So uh, project number one is going to be released today. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about it in today's lecture um, because actually the, the uh, piece of the system you'll be implementing, uh, the, the buffer pool, uh, we're, we're going to discuss in, in um, the next lecture um, on Wednesday. So uh, I'm not going to talk about it today, but it, it should be released to you um, if you want to take a look uh, by the end of the day today. So the second piece, uh, project number zero was due last night at 11.59 p.m. Uh, if you'll recall from the previous lectures, the first lecture and the, the last two lectures uh, and also on the website, uh, it, was, it was explicit that if you, if you didn't or weren't able to complete um, the project by, by the deadline with a score of 100%, uh, you're, you're not gonna be able to continue um, in the course. So that's uh, uh, administrative assignment stuff. Uh, one other thing is that there will be um, the, the database tech talks starting today, uh, this afternoon, right after class actually. Um, the, the website is there um, and uh, we're, we're gonna have different uh, uh, people come every week. Um, it, they're all on Zoom so you can um, just join the Zoom call. Uh, all, all the information should be on the website uh, for how to join. And they're, they're um, not like marketing talks, they're, they're like really low level um, tech talks so you can kind of see how some of the um, topics and, and concepts that we cover in the course uh, are being applied in, in real world systems. So if you're interested in those, feel free to uh, join um, the talks. So, uh, if you'll recall from, from last lecture, uh, we talked about kind of the, the uh, f focus of the course is going to be about this disk-oriented or disk-based architecture. So in that, we assume the, the uh, DBMS has its primary storage on some kind of non-volatile disk. That could be a regular hard disk. It could be an SSD. Um, but the, the, the key idea is that the storage medium that uh, the, is the, the primary location where the, the database lives is on some kind of non-volatile storage. So if we remove power, that means that we're going to keep all of the data that we have um, in the database. We're not gonna lose it. Whereas if it's in you know, memory or the CPU cache and we, we get rid of the power, we're, all our data is gone. Uh, so, kind of the, the DBMS rather than the OS, and we talked about why um, it's important that the DBMS manage this process, but the DBMS is going to um, handle all of the, the data transfer uh, between non-volatile and volatile storage, so from disk to memory and back again um, when we want to persist uh, our, our data. So uh, just to kind of recap some, some topics we talked about last time, um, the, the idea of slotted pages um, is a uh, common layout scheme um, in uh, database systems where uh, what we're going to do is we're going to map individual tuples in a page uh, to these slots. So uh, you have the, the slot array along the top, which is going to um, uh, handle the uh, offsets of the tuples, and then we have fixed and variable length tuples along the bottom um, that the slot arrays are going to point to. So we have pointers in these slot arrays, and that allows us to fill up uh, uh, pages with variable size tuples. We don't have to worry about um, finding the location of individual tuples inside a page. So again, these two, um, uh, the slot array and the, the tuple data at the end of the page are going to grow towards each other uh, in the middle. Just give me one second here to make sure. Okay. Um, okay. So kind of an alternative uh, uh, storage approach 
uh, that's that's the the slotted slotted array uh, page approach. An alternative storage approach uh, is what we call log structured file organization. So rather than storing the the tuples, the data directly in the pages, um, the the DBMS is only going to store uh, basically log records. So by log records, what I mean is um, kind of uh, logs of what data we're inserting uh, and how we're updating the data in the system. So every time, for example, we're going to insert a new tuple, we're going to store that as a log record in a page. If we want to delete a tuple, all we do is we mark that tuple and the page is deleted. Uh, and if we want to update something, we just uh, add a log record to the page that, that specifies which is the uh, data value that we updated. So what this is going to look like is, again, we're going to have a page, and we're just going to go through and start appending these new entries um, as, as we make changes to our data. So you'll see here we're inserting a tuple with ID, uh, ID 1 and value A. We insert another tuple, ID 2, value B. Uh, we delete a tuple with ID 4 and so on. Um, and kind of rather than storing the actual values, we're just storing these uh, sort of log records that uh, specify the changes that we're making to the tuples um, in the database. So can anyone tell me what, like, why we might prefer this storage layout versus the uh, other one we talked about with the, the slotted um, array layout? Like what, what advantage would this sort of storage layout have uh, over the, that is correct. So uh, you're going to get really fast writing uh, with this because you can just rather than having to go and update individual val individual tuples in a page, you can just append um, the log records to the end, uh, and it's really fast to write. Um, it's also great for disk I/O because uh, if you recall from last class, we talked about the advantages of having uh, sequential writes versus, uh, or sequential reads or writes versus random I.O. So in this case, uh, since we're always appending to the end of the, the page, um, you get much better sequential performance. So of course, if uh, uh, we get fast writes here, then on, on the other side of things, uh, it's going to become a little bit trickier to do reads. So to read a record, what we have to do is essentially scan this log backwards in order to, to recreate the tuple um, that uh, we, we want to query. So for example, in order to, to reconstruct, uh, let's say tuple ID2, we have to start reading the log record back and we say, okay, um, we're updating the value to value Y and then we go back further and we get the other uh, potential um, attribute values for that tuple by, by reading back through the log records. So we kind of have to do this uh, reverse scan over the log to reconstruct the tuple um, by applying basically all of these log records along the way. So of course we can do different optimizations like we could build uh, an index that would allow us to jump into the log just to find um, the, the different log records that apply to um, each of the tuples, so that way we don't have to do you know, a full scan through all of the log records. We could just, for example, if we want to find all of the, the log records that apply to ID2, we can go through and just pick out those individual ones. Um, that's okay, but again, now you have to have this uh, additional data structure where you're maintaining kind of these uh, offsets to go find the, the exact log records for particular tuple. Yes? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question a little louder? Why is it back? So the question is, why is the scan um, through the, the page backwards and not forwards? Um, I, I guess that I, you could implement it either way. It, it doesn't really matter. I think there are certain conditions where um, uh, it, it may be more efficient to implement it one way versus the other. Uh, so for example, if you're scanning backwards, uh, and you get, as soon as you hit uh, uh, the insert, you know that you're done, you don't have to scan any further backwards, whereas if you're scanning forwards, you may have to scan, I mean, you would have to scan all the way to the end of the file because you don't know if there are any other um, changes or update log records that are coming in the future. But if you scan backwards, you could, as soon as you see the insert, or perhaps even as soon as you see like a delete, 
you could just uh, abort your scanning early. You don't have to continue all the way to the beginning. Does that make sense? Yes. If we were, if we were replicating the database, uh, would a log structured file organization be more advantageous than a slot map or array? So the question is if if the, the database is rep replicated um, on several machines in a, in a distributed setting, would a log structured file organization be uh, more advantageous than the, the slotted page array? Um, I think it depends on a lot of factors. Um, I think that probably um, the, the biggest advantage to the, or the, the biggest reason you would choose a log structured layout is based on the uh, read versus write ratio of your application. Um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head where uh, you would prefer this for a uh, distributed setting. Maybe it's a little bit easier um, to have something like eventual consistency where if, if your um, distributed nodes uh, aren't necessarily all simultaneously updated like you could have um, updates, you know, trickle to uh, replica nodes um, over time. It, this this might be a little bit better uh, because then you know you could just to, to apply the update, you just add, append a new uh, record rather than trying to uh, lock things in a distributed setting. But um, I I don't think that there's any inherent advantage or would be any inherent advantage uh, in a distributed setting. Um, so you can build indexes that help you kind of uh, navigate these these log pages. Another option is uh, you could you know periodically compact the log. So again, we kind of have all of these log records building up. We have to replay them in order to kind of get individual reconstruct individual tuples. Uh, if we if we perform a compaction, we could get something that looks like this. Basically, we just you know squash down all of the, the log records into uh, single values, so now we don't have to, to you know, to reconstruct um, tuple ID2. We can just go and look it up uh, in the page. So kind of we can perform this periodically, you know, lock the page, make sure no one can do anything concurrently, and then perform this compaction, um, and then release release the lock. So kind of it it uh, simplifies things a little bit. We don't have to scan uh, through the whole page again. We can just kind of um, go and look at the the. Uh, individual tuple values. So there are a whole bunch of systems um, that that uh, kind of take this this approach versus the the um, other slotted page approach that we talked about. Um, it's it's become a lot more popular in you know the last ten years or so. Uh, a lot of these systems are more recent. You may know LevelDB uh, is from Google. Um, RocksDB actually is uh, from Facebook. They took LevelDB. Um, and kind of, well, the first thing they did is they, uh, they ripped out MMAP from LevelDB uh, because, as we talked a little bit about last time, MMAP has some problems. But um, so RocksDB is kind of a fork of LevelDB uh, from Facebook, uh, wh which they're currently using, or the, the idea was to replace uh, the default storage engine for uh, MySQL. They had a huge uh, MySQL deployment. The idea was to replace the, the default storage engine for MySQL. Um, with with RocksDB, and again, this has kind of taken off in in the last ten years. But the idea isn't new. Um, there were there were papers published twenty or thirty years ago, uh, kind of uh, detailing these um, techniques. So to go a little bit uh, further into detail about how the the compaction actually works, um, basically we're we just want to, as I said coalesce or uh, uh, squash together these larger log files into sm smaller files by removing unnecessary records. So for example, if you have uh, you know, a bunch of updates, you can just squash those down into one um, that, that specifies the value of the tuple. So the way this usually works is um, we perform this, this level compaction where at you know, level zero is the, the top level. Um, we kind of have this sorted log file that's building up and we build up all these pages over time and what we'd like to do is perform uh, a, a periodic compaction. So perhaps when these two pages fill up, what we're going to do is 
you know, squash them down into a, a larger file in, in the next level. So we take those two pages, kind of uh, replay them to, to perform the compaction, we get this uh, compacted, larger, uh, sorted log file that's now in level one. And again, you know, more log files are gonna build up in the top level, and we kind of just keep repeating this process, um, compacting the files into, into uh, you know, s smaller single files, and eventually we get, we get down to some you know, bottom layer where everything is, is fully compact. So you can think of it kind of like uh, a merge sort or something where you have these different runs that you've sorted independently and now you want to merge them together into one um, larger uh, run that's, that's all sorted together. So kind of this is how the uh, level-based compaction works. There's an alternative uh, which is called universal compaction where basically what we do is we can just take any two adjacent uh, uh, blocks and merge them together like this. So rather than doing it in levels where we're specifically working from you know, the, the top level that has these pages that fill up and then merging them as we go down, um, we can just start merging you know, adjacent um, uh, files uh, in, in sort of a, a universal uh, f setting. And this is actually used by um, it was created for RocksDB by Facebook. So there's no level concept here, we're just merging uh, adjacent files. Okay, so that's it for um, uh, page-based storage. So we kind of looked at, again, the uh, slotted page-based approach and the um, log-structured approach. So uh, that's, that's kind of it at the page level. Now we're going to move on to kind of um, the, the next level down, which we started talking a little bit about last time, um, the, the data representation at the level of the tuple. You know, if we have an individual tuple inside a page, how do we um, store it? How do we interpret the data that's stored inside of it? Um, and how do, how do different layers of the DBMS um, leverage the, or extract the data that they need from uh, the, the tuple storage? So that's gonna be the first piece. The next piece we're gonna talk about is kind of uh, uh, system catalogs. So how does the um, DBMS as a whole store information about the data that's stored in tables? So if you wanna know, for example, the schema for a particular table, like the student table, you need to know that students have an ID, a name, an email address, et cetera. Um, how is that stored within the system? And then finally, we're going to wrap up talking about a few different uh, high-level storage model alternatives. So again, uh, I showed this slide in the, the last lecture. Um, just at a high level, tuple, uh, a tuple is essentially just a sequence of bytes. So think about it, just a, a series of bytes stored inside a page um, that has some data in it and the, the various pieces of the storage manager uh, are going to tell us how to extract individual um, uh, data values from that sequence of bytes. So the DBMS figures out you know, how it's going to interpret these um, bytes and give us, give us values back. So the catalog, as I mentioned, is going to contain the high-level schema, uh, which is just information about the tables. It's going to tell us you know, how exactly um, the bytes are laid out inside a tuple. So uh, the, the different data types we have to worry about, um, the, these are probably the most common. There may be some other ones, and of course there can be uh, user-defined types, but uh, pretty much this is, this is what you'd expect to be working with. So things like um, integers, uh, there are different uh, sizes, integer sizes uh, described in the standard. Um, based on how many distinct value, like the range of values that they uh, should be able to support. So those are integer, big int, small int, tiny int. Um, basically what these are stored as is their you know, C or C++ uh, representation. So if you have an integer um, that fits in, you know, just there are 256 distinct values, you can store that in a single um, byte. If you, you know, have a, an integer in a, in a larger range, you may need to use a four byte uh, or eight byte um, value. So basically, these map uh, more or less pretty um, clearly from 
SQL data types to uh, C or C++ um, data types. Uh, floating point uh, values are a, a little bit trickier, um, and, and we'll talk more about those in detail, but um, essentially for floating point values, you can think about you know, things that you would store in um, a 32-bit or 64-bit uh, floating point. Uh, numeric and, and decimal types are special fixed point decimal types, um, which, which we'll, we'll cover in the next uh, slide. Uh, so in varchar, var binary text are all basically just variations on strings. So usually um, they are stored as uh, a, some kind of header that specifies the length of the string, followed by uh, just you know, uh, a, a series of bytes that represent um, the, the string data, the character data. Uh, sometimes I guess you, know, you, you could also store it as um, uh, null terminated, like in C or C++, you could store it as a null terminated uh, string, but, but most systems I think um, implement it with this, this length header followed by uh, some number of bytes. Uh, and then finally, you know, time, date, and timestamp I think um, were, were pretty important in the homework. Uh, and basically, again, this is just, you can think of it as like a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer um, that stores a number of seconds or microseconds or uh, whatever it is since the, the Unix epoch, so uh, January 1st, 1970. And you can kind of convert that uh, back and forth from um, the, this integer value to uh, a, a date. So kind of the, the trickiest one I mentioned is, is uh, floating point values uh, or numeric values. So these are arbitrary precision um, uh, numbers and they're kind of the most difficult uh, to deal with. So we're gonna talk about some kind of specialized ways that uh, systems uh, tackle them. So kind of the, the big problem with variable precision numbers is that they're, they're inexact and they have um, they're difficult to represent in uh, uh, computer architecture. So um, as you may know, like floats or, or double uh, data types um, in C or C++ are approximate representations of uh, decimal numbers. And this is the IEEE 754 uh, standard, kind of specifies how they should be stored. Um, and th they're uh, typically faster than um, kind of these arbitrary precision numbers that we're going to implement things like uh, decimal type or numeric type that we're going to implement in the, da the database management system, but um, they can have rounding errors is a big problem with them. So, you know, if you think about something like, um, I don't know, you're just collecting maybe like temperature data about my office or something, uh, a little imprecision in that might be okay. Uh, I probably don't need finer grain values than you know whole whole degree numbers. But um, if you're storing data that's like uh, I don't know the balance of your bank account, uh, you might care if there are going to be rounding errors. So, kind of just as an example of of what this looks like, uh, this is just a really simple C program. Um, basically, we just have these two uh, floats x and y. X is 0.1 y is uh, 0 0.2. The first print statement uh, is going to just print the sum of x and y. Uh, so it just prints out 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. And the second print statement is just going to print out the value uh, 0 0.3. So who can tell me what uh, the result of this, if, if I compile and run it, what's it gonna look like? It's not a trick question. So the values that are gonna get printed out, uh, this is the output. Um, you, can, you can try it on, on your own machine. Um, so x plus y gives us 0 0.3 uh, with a bunch of zeros after it, which is what you'd expect. Uh, and printing out the, the constant value, uh, 0 0.3, also gives uh, 0 0.3 with a bunch of zeros after it. Um, that looks fine. Um, but if we, you know, specify that we want more precision in our program, uh, so here it, it just changed the um, uh, print statements to control the number of um, significant digits that get printed out, what we end up with is something that looks a little bit different. So 
the, first, the first one, x plus y, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, um, I think we can all say that that's uh, not quite correct. Um, after several zeros, we get kind of this garbage at the end. And also, printing out 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.29999 is not quite uh, 0 0.3. So again, um, depending on the, the type of data you're working with, you can tolerate a little bit of imprecision. Um, these these uh, floating point values might be okay and they'll be fast, but uh, if it's something important like a bank account that you wanna make sure you get the values right, um, we can't tolerate this, this loss of precision in uh, the database. So, that's going to uh, force us as, as the developers of the DBMS to implement um, numeric data types that have a fixed amount of precision. So we guarantee some level of precision in the data types that we implement. Um, it could be potentially arbitrary, um, precision and scale, and we want to use these when rounding errors in the data are unacceptable. So the data types are numeric and, and decimal data types. And there are many, many different implementations um, of how exactly these things work in, in real systems. Um, typically, the, the, the commercial ones are much more sophisticated since they know, you know people, business applications have a lot of uh, need for um, fixed precision uh, numeric values. So um, they, they typically have, have pretty sophisticated uh, implementations, but um, kind of there's no hard and fast way that, that all systems implement this. Everyone does something a little bit different. Um, but kind of again, the trade-off is that it, to, to ensure the, the amount of precision that you need is going to require uh, more overhead in your processing. So you're gonna have to be more careful than just using the, the basic 32-bit, 64-bit floating point values that C or C++ uh, provide to you. So just as a few examples, uh, we'll look at uh, first what Postgres does to implement their numeric data type. So this is the struct um, that they specify in their code. Uh, so we look at the different pieces. Basically, you start out with the you know, number of digits that you have in your, your numeric data type, the weight of the first digit, the scale factor, uh, whether it's positive or negative or a NAN. Um, and then the, the, the uh, uh, actual digits themselves. So that's the last piece there. And if we kind of look at what that actually is implemented as, uh, numeric digits are basically just a, a char array. So it's just uh, char bytes stored um, in some variable length array that we can use to decode uh, these, these individual values. So, if we look at now how the code to actually handle this looks, uh, you know, if you have a, a floating point value, it's just one instruction or whatever um, to add them together. All of this, and it's, it's cut off at the bottom, you, know, you have these nested if statements, switch statements, all kinds of stuff going on in there, um, just to add two of these numeric data types together. Uh, so, you know, you have to check is, is, what's the sign of the first the first value you're, you're trying to add was the sign of the second value and all this kind of uh, stuff that has, this has to execute every single time for every single uh, uh, tuple where you want to add these, these two values together. So you can see this, this quickly gets a lot more expensive than um, uh, just, just using floating point values, yes. Uh, so the question is, has it, it, floating point values are, are uh, fast because there's dedicated hardware for it. Has anyone ever tried um, making dedicated hardware to add fixed point values together? Um, I, the, the short answer is I do not know. Um, I, there could be, especially in you know, other uh, communities outside of data management, um, things like hardware, software, co-design, um, there may there may be research that looks at that, uh, but I'm I'm personally not familiar with any of it. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, since there are some 
uh, uh, DBMS vendors that have tried to uh, fabricate specialized hardware for um, their, their DBMS product, but I, I am not familiar with anyone who, who specifically has, has you know, designed any, any piece of hardware to do this um, uh, fixed point uh, addition or computation in general. But I can look into it and, and get back to you next class. So that was Postgres. Uh, this is MySQL. Um, MySQL, this is their numeric type. This is the struct uh, that defines it's a decimal. And again, we have these, these pieces that tell us the you know, number of digits uh, before the decimal point, after, after the decimal point, the length and bytes of the value, the sign, whether it's positive or negative, and then the actual digit storage. And again, um, kind of similar, this is stored uh, as int32 rather than just uh, a char array, uh, but the, the, the end result is the same, basically. You're storing this, this variable length array of uh, digits that you then need to decode, again, with all of this difficult logic. So this is uh, the, the add function from or a subset of the add function from uh, MySQL. And again, you're kind of going through and doing all of this complicated um, if-else conditional switch statements, all kinds of stuff to check um, and, and to, to perform the actual computation um, by, by decoding the uh, values that are stored in the, the uh, data array. So does anyone have any questions about uh, kind of the, the fixed point um, arithmetic before we move on. Great. Okay, so the next piece um, that I want to talk a little bit about, bit about is for large values. I think uh, someone in the last class asked uh, either what happens if an individual value is too large for a data page or if an individual tuple is too large for a data page. Um, I think I said that, that uh, there's nothing in theory stopping a, a tuple from spanning multiple pages um, or a, a value, an individual value from spanning multiple pages. I think most systems don't uh, allow a tuple to exceed the size of a single page. So it's constrained either in the um, size of the columns or the number of columns or both. Um, and you're, you're not able to specify a single tuple that's gonna be larger than one page. So now the problem comes up is what if we have individual values that are larger than a page? So imagine a really long string or something. Uh, the way that we store that is in what's called an overflow page. So basically we're just going to take the, the individual tuple that we have and we're going to specify the value. Uh, in this case, C is a, is a really large value and it's just going to point to the varchar data that's stored in this uh, overflow page. Now, of course, you know, maybe that's, that's again too big uh, for the overflow page. So you know, this could, in theory, span multiple pages. You could just point um, to a chain of pages uh, to, to have an arbitrarily large uh, uh, varchar value. So this is called different things in different systems. Uh, Postgres calls it toast, um, which th these overflow pages are going to kick in if the, the value is greater than uh, two kilobytes. Uh, MySQL, um, I think it's greater than half of uh, the size of the whole page, or in SQL Server, if it's greater than the size of a page, then this, this uh, is gonna kick in. So, kind of an alternative way to handling these large um, string objects, usually, is uh, to, to store it externally to the DBMS. So, kind of, we talked in, in earlier lectures about why it's a good thing for the, the database management system to kind of have full control uh, over all of the data so it, it you know, can understand everything that's going on, manage the, the safety and all the properties we want to apply uh, or to ensure for the data. Um, but uh, you know, if you get sufficiently large data, there are certain cases where um, you may want to have that stored externally to the DBMS. So some systems let you store um, th this type of really large file in what's called the blob, uh, binary large object. So 
Uh, and the different systems call it different things. I think it's called a B file and Oracle uh, or file stream in Microsoft. Uh, but basically, um, the, the way the blob works is you just store, uh, again, sort of a reference in the tuple, and that's going to point to some um, external object. So uh, can anyone think of a, you know, a, a use case when this might come in handy? Uh, what sort of data might you want to store external to the, the DBMS? Netflix, <laughs> uh, Netflix is, is a good example. So basically, um, like multimedia data. Um, images uh, or videos that kind of don't fit well with the, the data model in our, in our DBMS. Uh, you know, if you think you have an individual um, Netflix, like, like video file, movie file, that can be gigabytes, so you don't, you know, that doesn't fit well in, in our um, DBMS, so we kind of just store a pointer to that data, and it lives somewhere else on the file system, and we can reference it when we need it. Uh, the, the, the kind of the, the drawback is that there's no explicit durability protection, so since it's outside the DBMS, um, we can ensure that it's, it's stored uh, safely, kind of, you know, the, the part of the guarantee that we get from the DBMS is that if our, our uh, data is inserted, then it's going to be persistent. We're not going to lose anything, but you know, if it's stored externally, there's no way to control for that. And also there's no kind of transactional protection. So if you have some other um, uh, program that's concurrently modifying the file, um, we can't guarantee that it's going to be in a consistent state when we go to, to uh, read it. So uh, a question you might have is like, when, when do you want to take this approach versus um, when to store something you know, physically inside a, a DBMS page in one of those very uh, uh, overflow pages that we talked about? Um, so outside of you know, different uh, types of files like images or videos that, that don't fit well with the processing model we have, um, kind of the other, the other uh, reason you might want to do this is if you just have a large, uh, large enough, and by large enough, uh, there's a paper that came out. Um, this is from Jim Gray. I think I mentioned him before. He's a famous uh, uh, database researcher who won the Turing Award. Um, and this, this paper was kind of evaluating the size of when it's more beneficial to store uh, a blob directly inside uh, an overflow page versus externally. And kind of the conclusion they came to, uh, I think this is about 15 years ago this paper came out, um, the conclusion they came to was about 256 kilobytes is when it's more beneficial to store externally because again, remember we have to, if it's stored inside the DBMS, inside the database, and we have to you know, read pages, and we, we get these huge objects written to and from disk every time. So kind of that's the, the trade-off that, that uh, they figured out. And the, the exact numbers may be different now, but kind of thinking at a high level, there may be cases when you, it's more beneficial for you to store it directly inside the DBMS, other cases where it's more beneficial to store um, as an external um, object. So the next piece um, that we're going to talk about is, is the, the system level catalogs. So um, in order for the uh, DBMS to know what's going on with, with the uh, data stored in the database, it keeps all sorts of metadata about the database um, internally so it can you know, perform different uh, uh, tasks. So as I mentioned, one of the most important things is we need to know how to encode and decode uh, the, the data that's stored in the, the uh, just bytes that represent tuples. So we store information about tables, columns, indexes, views, all the, that kind of like structural stuff. Um, DBMSs typically also store information about uh, users and permissions, so like access permissions, which users should be able to view or modify which uh, pieces of data. And finally, they keep around a lot of internal statistics, so things like um, the number of distinct values or uh, join cardinalities or data ranges, things like that, uh, which are going to be really important for um, query execution, which we'll talk about in later lectures, things like planning the most efficient way to execute a query. It's helpful if you know statistics about uh, the data that you're storing. So almost every DBMS um, 
that I know of stores the, the database's catalog like inside of itself. So it, it basically just stores it using the same uh, abstractions, things like tables, indexes, that kind of stuff, um, that it uses to store regular data. So now the problem is there's like this chicken and egg problem where um, if, if we need to write a SQL query to query the metadata, um, but we need the metadata to answer the, answer the SQL query by you know, decoding values or referencing objects, um, it's not clear where, where we would start. So kind of the, what, what systems do is they have these kind of special wrappers um, around uh, metadata objects that the, the system can use to directly encode and decode the values um, in store, stored as part of the system catalog. So they, they like bootstrap the catalog tables in that way. So uh, you can, can, as the user, can query the DBMS's internal um, catalog. It's, it's usually stored in this information schema um, to get information about the database. You can see all of the objects that are stored in the database. It'll tell you information about um, tables, metadata, statistics, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it's defined as, by the ANSI standard as the set of uh, read-only views that um, are going to provide you know information about everything you need to know that's stored in the database and kind of before this was standardized it was sort of a mess uh, where every kind of system had their own way of, of uh, exposing the the metadata um, so kind of to make it to make it more manageable and portable um, they they codified it in the the standard so that you know all of the systems are exposing the same um, metadata to the, the users. Uh, and there are also like uh, a lot of non-standard shortcuts. Um, if you were uh, playing around with SQLite at all, you may have looked at some of those uh, to, to kind of show um, what tables or uh, data was, was stored in the schema. So just a, a, I'll show a few examples. Um, if you want to list all of the tables in the current database, uh, you can write it as this you know, SQL 92 compliant query, we are saying select star from information schema dot tables, and you can get the table catalog is, is the name of the, the database that you're interested in. Uh, and these are some of the, just some of the shortcuts that, that different systems have. So in Postgres, you can just do backslash D, uh, MySQL is show tables, and SQLite is dot tables. So again, you know, to, to get the schema for just a, an individual table. Um, you want to get all the, the uh, information from student. You can, again, select star from information schema dot tables where the table name is student. Um, and again, there are all these different shortcuts in the different systems where you can uh, get the same, the same data that's provided uh, by the, the standard SQL query. Okay, so are there any questions about schemas or catalogs uh, before we move on to the, the last part of the lecture, which is about the data storage models? Okay. Okay, so kind of um, an important piece to talk about before we actually look at the different storage models, uh, high-level storage models, is to talk about the different types of database workloads that we can have. So um, the, the first one we'll talk about is what's called online transaction processing, or OLTP. And basically what this means is that you have a lot of fast, short, short-running operations that only access, so either read or update a, a small of data, a small amount of data each time. So you can think about that as like you know your bank account. Uh, if you want to get the balance of your bank account, you're just reading um, one value. Or if you want to you know do a transaction, deposit money, withdraw money, uh, it's a fairly sh short transaction. Another way to think about it is something like um, you know an, an online store like Amazon or something. Um, you, you go through, browse uh, different products, add them to your shopping cart, check out, pay, ship, uh, and the, the amount of data uh, that you're accessing 
uh, relative to you know all of the products that Amazon offers is relatively small, so you're just you know buying a few individual products. Um, but if you think about you know all of the the people around the world that are concurrently uh, making purchases, then it it starts to add up. So kind of the the, the amount of data that is uh, accessed or modified by individual transactions, so your individual purchases, is relatively small, but taken in aggregate across all of the concurrent transactions, it can, it can get quite large. So that's online transaction processing. The kind of other side um, uh, of the spectrum is what's, what's known as online analytical processing, OLAP or OLAP. Uh, and basically, these are kind of like analytical queries that um, read lots and lots of data. So uh, they scan whole tables, they produce aggregates, there are lots of joins. Um, these are used typically in things that are like decision support or business intelligence. You kind of want to um, look at all this data that you've accumulated and see if you can get any insights out of it. So you're, you're uh, executing these large-scale queries um, that provide you some type of useful or meaningful answer. Um, this is kind of similar to like what, what the homework assignment was. You know, you wanted to figure out certain high-level information about um, different products or answer queries like uh, in, in the Amazon example, uh, maybe Amazon wants to know, okay, what uh, are the top five most popular products um, purchased in the past month by CMU students? So kind of you want to you want to scan a large uh, sample rather than just updating individual or reading individual records. You want to scan a large sample and see if you can get any um, useful insights out of it. So these uh, uh, typically are are longer term, um, long running queries. Uh, they might happen overnight, um, or they might be uh, run to populate like a, a report or something that you give to a, a higher level executive or decision maker. Uh, and they're oftentimes a lot uh, ad hoc. So they're not queries that are repeated a lot, unlike you know, transaction processing. Every new order transaction that gets sent to Amazon basically has the same template. Um, the OLAP queries are usually uh, kind of one-off, ad hoc, um, and, and more specialized. So that's kind of, on the one side, you have OLTP, OLAP on the other side. Um, there's this new buzzword thing uh, that's becoming more popular recently. Uh, it's called Hybrid Transaction and Analytical Processing, or HTAP. Uh, and basically, the, the goal is to be able to do OLTP and OLAP to get together on the same um, database instance. So you have essentially your transaction processing and your analytics running concurrently. Uh, hopefully you can get, you know, the, the idea is you'd be able to get um, faster or more real-time insights about the transactional data that's coming in. So if you think about kind of the, the uh, spectrum here that you have, um, on the x-axis is the workload, fo workload focus. Um, OLTP is more heavily uh, uh, geared towards writes. There are some reads, um, obviously, that you need to do, but um, think about you know the ordering a new product. You want to insert information into the table that you ordered it. Uh, you want to insert information about your your shipping address. Um, maybe update update some uh, aggregated data that that Amazon stores about you. Um, whereas for for the analytical queries, they're more heavily read focused. So they're going to spend a lot of their time scanning a lot of tables, performing a lot of joins to kind of get the, the data together uh, that you need for the analysis. Then on the y-axis, um, there's the like notion of operation complexity. So how complex is the query or the program that you're running uh, for each of these workloads? So again, OLTP is towards the simpler side you know, just inserting new records, updating individual values um, in, in tables, like I don't know, maybe you update, update your um, payment information or your shipping information that's just, you know, changing a few uh, uh, values and fields, versus on the other end, uh, OLAP is usually a lot more complex, again, joining many tables or performing uh, complex um, aggregations, 
windowing functions, all, all that kind of stuff that you saw in the homework. And again, kind of this HTAP uh, sits somewhere in between. You want to do both of these things um, at the same time. So the way that this usually looks in practice is um, a, a uh, company will, an organization will set up um, these kind of two separate environments. So on the one side, you'll have uh, usually multiple OLTP data silos. So you have all of these database instances running, um, accepting you know, concurrent uh, connections from different clients uh, to perform the transactional side of the workload. And then on the other end, you have this, this really big um, OLAP data warehouse where you're going to want to dump all of your data for analysis. So again, we kind of have all the transactions running on the, the OLTP side, all inserting or updating or whatever uh, their operations are on, on the individual silos. And then we're going to go through this process. Uh, it's usually called extract, transform, load, ETL, uh, where we take all of the data out of these different silos. It may be formatted differently. Uh, there may be redundant data. So for example, um, you could have two uh, uh, students with, with uh, the, the you could have a student stored in, in multiple uh, databases that has the same name. Uh, so it could be like my, my name, Andrew and Andy. Uh, and I, one is just my nickname or Drew. Uh, and you, you want to kind of merge these records into a single logical record during the CTL process um, to uh, get them cleaned and ready and formatted to go in the data warehouse. So kind of this ETL process might run uh, overnight or periodically throughout the day. We kind of gather all of the data from the different um, uh, siloed OLTP databases, format them, and then shove them into this uh, data warehouse where we're going to run uh, different analytical queries. So again, kind of based on the, the results of the analysis we perform, we might want to um, you know, push some data back out to our OLTP data silos. Um, in the Amazon example, maybe you know, we run the analysis to figure out what products the, the CMU students have been buying. So then we want to push back um, from our data warehouse to the uh, OLTP side pr uh, product recommendations when you, you know, visit the, the web page for it to buy. So again, kind of the, the uh, idea of moving the analytical queries um, and having them execute concurrently um, with the uh, transactional workload uh, is, is what this, this HTAP idea is about. So kind of why is all of this important? Why, why does it matter that we have these different types of workloads? Well, if you think back to the relational model, it doesn't really specify, you know, how we store the data. It, you know, gives us certain rules and requirements for the different operations we should be able to perform on the data, but it doesn't tell us how physically we need to store the data. And in fact, as we've seen, a lot of different systems store the data in all sorts of different ways. Uh, there's, you know, the different page layouts, slotted pages, uh, log structured pages, all different kind of options there. There's all different kinds of options in storing individual data types. But um, you know, going a step further, there's nothing that says that we have to store kind of a, a, a tuple's attributes together in a single page, like as consecutive bytes, as, we, as we've been doing. So uh, I think I mentioned early on that, that kind of there's this notion of uh, a row and why that might be different from a, a tuple or a record. And that's because the, the row storage layout assumes that all of the, the different attributes in a tuple are stored uh, consecutively. So again, if you have the, the student record that has ID, name, email address, you'd store all of those uh, in consecutive uh, values. So based on those different workloads that we talked about, um, OLTP, OLAP, uh, it, the row layout might not actually be uh, the best for all cases. 
So I'll, I'll kind of go through and explain um, what that means. And just as an example, uh, we'll use this simplified version of uh, the Wikipedia schema. Uh, so that it's just cut down to, to three tables. Basically, you have a user account, which is you know the w Wikipedia users. Um, they have a user ID and a name. Um, you have the different pages, which store the, the Wikipedia data. Uh, and then you have a, a revision history, which says which um, uh, edits or revisions were made by which users to which pages. So kind of those are the uh, uh, two references there. User ID references the user account table and uh, page ID references the pages table. And I just, I'll point out there's this one other uh, uh, cyclic reference here from pages back to revisions. Uh, it basically is just if uh, an optimization that Wikipedia does is um, if you want to get the most recent revision for a page, is they store it uh, right in the page. So if you think about kind of the OLTP um, types of queries that we might be running against uh, the Wikipedia pages, um, again, it's just simple queries that read or update small amounts of data. Um, so usually single entities. Uh, it, it might be things like you know getting the, the uh, page data. It might be updating when the last time um, a, a user logged in, or it might be adding a new uh, uh, record into the revisions table. So just kind of these really short running, simple um, operations that uh, only read or write a few um, values in, in the database. And this is, you know, if, if you have a, a new company or a startup or something, or, this is usually the type of application um, that people build first. So you kind of have these transactional things for your new app or whatever um, that basically uh, manage the, the uh, simple uh, aspects of uh, the application. So kind of on, on again, the other side, the, the analytical side, um, we're reading, we're issuing complex queries that read uh, large portions of the database. So uh, in this example query here, uh, we're counting the number of uh, distinct logins over the last month from uh, users where their, the host name is like uh, .gov. So where you have people logging in from .gov. Uh, this example is just from a, a, there was a scandal 10 or 15 years ago um, where p politicians were having like staffers uh, log into their Wikipedia pages and they, they would have them remove unflattering or scandalous things or a whole bunch of people like uh, Mike Pence, uh, Joe Biden, I think, a, whole, a whole bunch of people that, that um, were having staffers do this. So kind of if you wanted to know how many uh, times staffers were logging into Wikipedia uh, and, and making these types of edits. Um, you could issue this kind of like analytical query um, against the data that you collected on the transactional OLTP side of things. So all of those revisions that we were adding um, or, or uh, so revisions or logins or those types of things that we're adding, you can query those later uh, to, get, to get insights out of them. So, Again, I, I hinted that this was leading towards uh, discussion of storage models. And um, the, the, the key piece behind this is that uh, we can store tuples differently behind the scenes. So without, without exposing this to the application or the user um, that are perhaps better for uh, either OLTP or OLAP. So kind of what we've been talking about so far with this row-based storage model where you know, all of the values are stored consecutively is what's referred to as the Ennery storage model. So again, that's this row format where everything is just like an, an array of bytes where everything's stored consecutively. So again, everything's contiguous in a page and it's in particular ideal for OLTP workloads um, because queries tend to operate on individual records or in this case rows. So if we need to uh, read or update an individual row, we can go grab it. Um, and everything is, is stored together in a row format. Uh, if we want to do an insert, you know, we just insert now a bunch of, of contiguous values uh, that are all stored consecutively together in a page. So kind of 
the, the, this is the, the classic way we've been talking about this. Um, you know, if we want to get tuple number one, everything's stored together right there in the page. We have the header and all of the, the different aspects of it. Uh, and again, if we want to get any of these other tuples, we can just go and, and access all of the values together. So each of these um, pages are stored like this in a row-based format um, in, in the database. So this is kind of exactly how we've been talking about um, database pages so far. And again, if you just want to execute this, this simple query, say it's a login query or something, uh, we're going to load their profile. We need to go and get all the, the information about the user account from the user account table. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to send this query to our system. Uh, it's going to hit an index. So we haven't talked about indexes yet. We're going to talk about it in lecture seven. But basically, um, you can think about an index like, kind of like a page directory where um, you know, the page directory maps uh, page IDs to like physical locations. Uh, the index is going to map values, so like in this case a username or something, uh, to a page ID and record ID pair. So this query is going to go to the index. The index is going to tell us, okay, hey, go get this page. And then it's going to tell us which uh, a tuple exactly to, to locate in that page. So, and again, if we want to, you know, insert something, it's pretty straightforward. We just now add a, a new uh, row in, in that page right there. So kind of, this is, this is exactly how we've been, we've been talking about uh, database storage models so far. So that was the OLTP side. If we come back again to this query to get all of the uh, logins from, from .gov hosts, um, we can kind of see how this works uh, in a similar way. We're going to go, you know, get all the pages. We have to scan through all the pages because we don't know where, you know, what, what exactly we're looking for. We just want to look at all of the pages in the database. Um, and we're going to go through and perform first the filtering. So where the host name is like .gov. Uh, and that's going to require us to look at the values in that column, the host name column. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to have to go and look at this, this last login piece um, to, to do the, the count and the extract part of the query. And that, that means we need to look at the values in, in that uh, um, attribute there. So the big problem here is that what's going to happen with all of these other columns that we don't touch? We don't need to look at them uh, for this query. They don't have any impact on anything that we're doing. So kind of it's just useless data that we're having to read in from disk, even though we're not looking at it or touching it at all. So kind of to summarize, the, the um, NRE storage model has these advantages of, of really fast inserts, updates, and deletes. Uh, and they're good for queries that need to access the entire tuple. So again, you know, loading your whole profile when you log in, we need to access all the data in the tuple. But there are disadvantages, like in that, that uh, previous query I showed, um, they're not good. They have a problem with scanning large portions of the table or uh, subsets of attributes. Because what you're end ending up doing when you read a whole page is you're reading in you know, a bunch of columns or attributes that you don't need um, when there's no need to. Because they're, they're, they have no impact on reading the query, so they're eating up your um, I.O. bandwidth uh, file I.O. Band, disk, disk bandwidth with, with no uh, benefit. So kind of the, the alternative approach uh, to this NRE storage model that we can take is what's called the decomposition storage model, or DSM. And basically what we're going to do is the DBMS is going to store the values of a single attribute for all tuples contiguously in a page. So rather than storing all of the, the, the different attribute values for a single tuple contiguously, we're going to extract all of the uh, uh, attribute values for a single column, which is where the name column store comes from. We're going to extract all of those values and store those contiguously for several tuples. So this is ideal for like OLAP workloads where you have a lot of read-only queries. You don't have to do many updates um, or writes in general. Um, and you, you want to perform large scans, particularly over subsets of the attributes. So if you have now all of the um, values for a particular column stored in one page, you only need to read that page. You don't have to worry about the other uh, useless columns that don't get used in the query. So 
Again, as an example, if we go back here, uh, what we're going to do is store each of these uh, uh, attributes individually in a, in a page. So as an example, let's say the host name page, we're going to store the host names for all of the tuples together all in one page. And again, we're going to do the same thing for user ID, last login, username, whatever the other um, uh, attributes in the table are. So, uh, you know, they're, they're probably, if you have enough data, you'll end up with multiple pages. But the, the point is that for each attribute, for each um, unique column in the table, we're going to store the values for all of those columns uh, all together consecutively, contiguously. So now again, going back to this query, we only need the, the host name and the last login. We don't need any of that other stuff, um, that, that uh, any, any of the other attributes from the table. So we can just now go and get the pages that specifically correspond to those two um, uh, columns. We don't have to worry about the other, the other columns. We don't have any wasted bandwidth. We can just go get those uh, specific pages that we need for those columns. Yes? Uh, so the question is, um, if you had some kind of uh, a partitioning strategy where you split up the data into, let's say, it's organized by year, um, and you were you want you know more recent data grouped together so you can you know, sort it by year or something, and then um, partition it that way so you only get the most recent data versus older data you might not care about. Um, what storage model would that be under? So I guess uh, it's orthogonal in some ways to this row versus column um, layout. I, I, I think it's kind of like, so for example, you could have, um, you could take your, your row-based data in the NRE storage model, and you could sort that by year and partition that by year, so that way you still get, you know, kind of the, the temporal locality for uh, the data items. You could do the same thing with um, the the columnar storage or the the DSM. You could you know sort columns by you could sort sort the whole data by uh, year and partition it up that way. So I think uh, it's it's just a, an additional optimization that you could apply um, if you know that there's uh, some kind of, for example, temporal locality. Another way you could think about it is if you have um, different regions like uh, continents or something you have you know European clients and North American clients Asian clients whatever um, you can partition your data that way so um, I, I think uh, any sort of partitioning scheme or strategy that you apply uh, on top of this is is orthogonal to the the row versus column um, layout does that answer your question are there any other questions about kind of this, this NRE versus uh, a DSM trade-off? So th the next piece um, that we need to worry about in kind of the, the DSM um, implementation is how are we going to, you know, I, I told you that we were going to split up the tuples into um, individual column values and store all the column values uh, uh, together, how do we reconstruct um, an individual tuple? Like how, how do I get back to, you know, if I have the, the username and the email address and all that stuff split up and now I need to query an individual student, how do I get that back together um, to, to reconstruct the, the, the record? And uh, the answer is there, there are two different ways uh, that are typically um, applied. I think the, the offset based one is more common, so we'll talk about that first. So the idea is that you have um, these fixed length offsets that you can uh, apply because individual column values all have the same type. So for example, let's say user ID is a, uh, uh, just an integer. We know that's 
you know, 32 or 64 bits or whatever it is. So in order to access the nth uh, um, value, we can just figure out, okay, that's, you know, 32 bits times n gives us the offset of the ID in that column. At the same time, you know, if we want to go and get the, the email address or something, you can kind of just jump directly into the uh, uh, corresponding offset in the email address column. Now, you might run into a problem if you have variable length strings. Uh, there are different ways around this. One is, you know, you can pad out strings to a particular length. Um, if you have uh, a lot of repetition in the strings that you store, uh, you may be able to do some kind of encoding, like a dictionary encoding, where you replace strings with uh, just a fixed length integer code. Um, we're going to talk more about that kind of stuff uh, uh, in, in later lectures, but kind of the key idea is that if you split things up into columns, you can use these positional offsets to jump um, directly to the offsets you need to reconstruct individual tuples. Uh, the other option, again, is to, is to um, kind of store the IDs for individual tuples embedded uh, directly in the columns themselves. So rather than storing columns individually, you now have like these, these joint columns um, where you store first the, the ID followed by whatever the data value is that you have. And here they're all sorted in the same order, but you could imagine, you know, you could have individual columns sorted in completely different orders. Um, and then use the uh, uh, tuple IDs to reconstruct them. So you might ask, you know, why do I want to sort columns in different orders? Um, again, we're going to talk about this in, in uh, later lectures, but uh, it may allow you to, to apply uh, better compression. So, for example, if you have sorted data um, in a particular column, you might, you might be able to get better, uh, uh, like, for example, let's say it's uh, dates. You know, if all of your dates uh, happen to be, you know, just one day apart, you may be able to store some, like, uh, delta encoding where, you know, rather than storing the full date, you can just store a much smaller value that says this is just one day, uh, add one to the previous day. You can get kind of a, a much better compression. Uh, the other thing is, again, if you have um, sorted data that lets you do um, a binary search or some, some more intelligent uh, search, for individual values than having to scan uh, the whole column with like a sequential search algorithm. So those are kind of the two ways that you can um, rebuild individual uh, tuples. So uh, just to summarize, like for the NRE storage model, the, the um, DSM has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, obviously DSM reduces, as I mentioned, the amount of wasted I.O. because you only read uh, the data, the column specifically that you need. Uh, to answer your query, and you can get better query processing and uh, uh, compression for uh, the actual stored columns. Uh, the disadvantages are, you know, it's slow for point queries, so if you want to go and reconstruct uh, an indiv individual tuple, it's a lot easier if you just have it, you know, laid out in contiguously as a row, um, but here you have to kind of do some reconstruction, either uh, using the offsets or using the, the um, IDs as in the previous slide. Uh, and it, it's a lot harder to do, you know, ups, inserts, updates, that kind of stuff, because you have to go and, you know, add now uh, uh, values to multiple columns, multiple pages, rather than just writing um, all at once. So uh, DSM systems are not new. Uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, the first one I know of is from the 1970s. I, it's not actually like a, a DBMS, I think there's a Cantor is a file system, but basically if you look at what they're describing in the paper, it's a column store. Um, in the 1980s, there were the first like, I guess, theoretical underpinnings uh, or proposals for DSM storage. Um, in the 1990s, there's a product called Sybase IQ. Uh, so there, it's like a um, in-memory accelerator for uh, the Sybase uh, row store. I don't think it ever became that popular, but uh, kind of what they were doing was was uh, storing the data in memory um, in, a, in a columnar layout to accelerate certain types of queries. Um, it, it really took off in the early to mid-2000s with uh, these three systems, Vertica, VectorWise, and MonetDB. Um, if you're interested, you should, you should check them out. Um, they are uh, kind of the, the first 
uh, uh, popular and commercially successful um, column stores that, that really paved the way for a lot of the techniques um, that are now commonplace in, in columnar storage. And uh, it says 2010s everyone because um, it pretty much everyone, uh, and this is not everyone, but this is a, a small subset of everyone, uh, pretty much everyone nowadays uh, has some columnar storage um, option if, if you're in the uh, analytics or OLAP market. So pretty much if you have a, a row-based storage, NRE storage model for analytics, uh, you'll get crushed. So kind of everyone um, implements, including big, big commercial systems like Oracle implements this kind of uh, columnar storage model for um, the analytics uh, type queries. So just to wrap up, um, I, I kind of have been talking about a DBMS as, as having a stack comprised of these independent pieces. Um, as we've seen, they're not entirely independent and sometimes you need to know about certain other layers in the stack. So for example, the storage manager might need to know about kind of the higher level application pieces in order to pick you know, NRE versus DSM versus some other partitioning strategy. Um, so kind of, there's not always necessarily this clean cut between layers in the stack. Um, and it's really important to, to choose the correct storage model for the workload that you're uh, targeting. So just as a, as a high level piece, uh, if you got nothing else out of this lecture, just remember OLTP, you want row storage, and OLAP, you want column storage, because otherwise you'll get crushed. So uh, for next class, uh, we finished today, last lecture and today, the problem number one, which is how the DBMS represents the database and files on disk. And next class, we're going to talk about how you move uh, disk pages back and forth from disk to memory. And that's going to be the topic for the uh, first project, programming project, uh, the buffer pool. So thanks, and I will see you on Wednesday.